Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Shobita Parthasarathy. I am a professor of public policy and the director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program uh, at the University of Michigan, which is based in the Ford School of Public Policy. Thank you all for joining us today uh, to discuss our recently released Community Partnerships Playbook, which is a collaboration between our team in the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, or STPP, and three of our community partners, uh, Detroit Disability Power, We the People Michigan, and Detroit Justice Center. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes telling you a little bit about the STPP program and our community partnerships work. So the STPP program is an education, research, public and policy engagement center that's devoted to ensuring that science, technology and related public policies are in the public interest and bring us closer to the goals of social equity and justice. We do this in a variety of ways. We have a really robust set of educational programs. We have graduate, undergraduate, and postdoctoral uh, programs. And we also engage students in all of the applied research that we do, including the par partnerships playbook that you'll hear more about today. We house multiple applied research programs. Uh, our technology assessment project aims to use the history of technology to anticipate the social equity, environmental, and policy impacts of emerging technologies. We've issued reports on facial recognition technology in K through 12 schools, vaccine hesitancy, large language models or generative AI, and we're currently working on a project on small modular nuclear reactors. So look for that later in 2023 or early in 2024. But we're all here to discuss our community partnerships. Um, our community partnerships initiative, which we'll be discussing more today, is based on the idea that communities have important knowledge and concerns when it comes to science and technology, and that science and technology can better achieve the public good and social justice if we center communities in the conversation. So we work with community organizations to identify their needs and perspectives, and then support them by providing research briefs, reports, FAQs, and one-pagers. Our community partners then use our analyses to advocate for science and technology policies that are guided by the public interest. This includes, for example, analyses of tenant screening algorithms, acoustic gun detection systems like ShotSpotter, decentralized wastewater treatment, incorporating people with disabilities into climate action planning, and municipal fiber networks and its hope for bridging the digital divide. Our work is publicly available so that others can benefit from it as well. We're also hoping to expand our work in the coming months and years by helping our community partners build technologies that they want. And we currently have 12 community partners and we've done a number of projects with them. But if you're interested in working with us, whether or not you're, whether you're in Southeast Michigan or the Detroit area or beyond, please do get in touch. You can email us at stpp at umich.edu. So now I will turn it over to Molly Kleinman, who is the leader of the playbook on the STPP side. And I think you'll tell us a little bit about the playbook and have all the members of the team introduce themselves. Take it away, Molly. Thanks so much, Shobita. And thank you everyone uh, for being here today. Uh, I also just quickly want to thank Kristen Burgard and Tracy Van Dusen, who've done a whole lot of work behind the scenes to support the playbook and this webinar. Uh, I'm Molly Kleinman. I'm the managing director of STPP, and I was the lead on the playbook project. So yeah, I'm going to briefly give an overview of what the community partnerships playbook is and why we wrote it. Uh, then all of the panelists will have a chance to introduce themselves and we'll dive right in. Um, just a quick moment of housekeeping. We will have time for audience Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, you can enter them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar, and we will have time to get to them later. Uh, so as Shobita mentioned, the playbook is a collaboration between STPP, Detroit Disability Power, Detroit Justice Center, and We the People Michigan. It brings together advice from staff at all of these organizations who've had a range of both positive and negative experiences with researchers, academics, and technologists, along with the insights that we've developed from our community partnerships initiative and up-to-date scholarly literature. Um, next slide, please, Kristen. 
Um, as the popularity of community engagement grows among technologists and academics, it's vital to ensure that we engage communities in ways that are equitable, that benefit the people they're supposed to benefit, and that don't cause harm. Next slide. Uh, the playbook's purpose is both to guide researchers and to support and lend authority to community organizations as they advocate for partnerships that will benefit their constituencies. I saw that in our audience today, we have people from tech companies and universities, as well as nonprofits and community organizations and funders. And I hope that there is something in this playbook for all of you. Uh, for folks who haven't had a chance to read it yet, a quick overview of what's inside. You'll get a lot of the meat of these sections from the conversation that we're about to have, uh, but high level, the playbook includes qualities of good partnerships, guidance for community organizations who may be fielding these kinds of partnership requests or looking for researchers to work with them on a project because they already have a question in mind, uh, guidance for researchers who are often under pressure to do community engagement, but don't necessarily have access to support or training for how to do it well and do it in ways that don't unintentionally cause harm. Uh, and then finally, quest or questions that both partners should answer before the project begins across three different categories, values, goals, and logistics. Goals and logistics may feel more obvious, uh, but aligning on values is really crucial. And we'll probably talk today about why. Uh, and then finally, an overview of the literature on approaches to community engagement in research and technology development for people who want to dig deeper into this topic or take a look at what uh, what the peer reviewed literature has to say on these things. Um, so rather than much more detail, I want to use most of this time for our conversation with the panelists. Uh, in the process of putting together the playbook, uh, the student assistants who worked on this project and I uh, we're really lucky to have conversations with each of the co-authors about their experiences with partnerships, what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, and the, everything they said was just one gem after another. Uh, and so for this webinar, I really wanted to just bring some of those conversations directly to the audience. Um, so let's move right along to panelist introductions. Um, I want to note that one of our panelists today, Nancy A. Parker with the Detroit Justice Center, was not one of our original contributors. Uh, that was Erin Keith, who was also at DJC. She couldn't be here today, uh, but Nancy has graciously agreed to step in. Uh, in addition, Casey Pilar, who was one of the authors with DDP, was also unable to join us. Um, I just wanted to recognize those authors, even though they couldn't be here um, in the webinar today. Uh, so I'm going to ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves and their organizations uh, and to give an example or two about the kinds of projects or partners that they uh, have worked on. And uh, Nancy, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Molly. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Molly stated, I'm Nancy A. Parker. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Detroit Justice Center. Um, and I am stepping in for Aaron Keith, who was our managing policy counsel that uh, worked very closely um, with the whole team. Um, and we appreciate you guys very much. Um, at the Detroit Justice Center, we are a nonprofit law firm. Specifically, we are abolitionists. We are prison industrial complex abolitionists, which means that we are working towards a world where we do not have cages, um, policing, surveillance and we're working towards a just city. That's what we have coined it. And so we work alongside the community here in Detroit and the Metro Detroit area um, in supporting grassroots organization um, through our legal support, through um, any other avenues that we can help campaigns and to um, address the grave effects, quite truly, of mass incarceration um, as it has been um, directly felt by black and brown communities and poor communities here in the city of Detroit. And so we are a team of attorneys and non-attorneys um, that are working to uh, go on the defense to save people off from evictions and, and traffic to offensive and helping folks create community land trust and trying to be uh, dreaming for the future that we actually want where we don't have courts and I'm out of a job because we have uh, restorative justice steeped in our community and no one is picking up the phone to call 911 um, with that threat of harm. And so um, at DJC, you know, the phone rings a lot from time to time. 
Um, however, one of the sayings that we have now embedded in the culture at DJC is that if it is not a hell yes, it is a no. And so that means that um, for the partnerships to thrive, it has to be work that uh, fits into our mission and our values and one that our staff and the org writ large is excited about doing because we truly believe that this will contribute um, to uh, the, the greater goal that we are working towards. And I recognize that not, I mean, there could be some folks uh, here on the call today where me saying an, I'm an abolitionist is you're confused and blinking your eyes and now you got to go to Google to look it up, right? So I we understand that we are considered radical, that we're the far left of the left. And so um, being in partnerships with folks, we're coming in with eyes wide open that not all participants will be abolitionists and you don't have to be. But as long as you're working to address the ills of mass incarceration, as long as you um, you know, recognize the work that we do and where we stand in that field, we have the beautiful partnership with STPP that um, you know, has been ongoing where there's values on both sides and it has been nothing but a pleasure, right? We're respected, we feel that respect, we know that our expertise is valued, um, at the same level as the researchers, at the same level as the academics, not something that's different or less than, but literally equal, that we are coming as the experts in the field and of you know whatever that issue is. And we mutual respect is very much felt and when it is not there, it's readily apparent. Um, and so because we have that mantra of if it's not a hell yes, it's a no, um, we have been lucky enough to be in a position where we routinely don't engage with the cold calls for let's pick your brain, let's get quotes, what do you think about that, which feels very extractive and is not trying to further our mission. Instead, what they're looking for is opposition quotes or what is your position on, but you're not actually working towards the end goal of liberation of all people, which is what we're all doing this work for. Um, and so with that, I mean, there have been times where we have had um, more corporate researchers reach out. One, I think was about prisons um, and women incarceration rates. And, um, you know, we come with our expertise, we come with what we know to be true, right? And I understand that there will always be a push and pull, a pushback, that that's how you can get great discourse. But um, discounting things that people are saying is not a good relationship. You're not breeding trust. And it also makes us not want to work with you. Where in at the end, um, your output may be something that, you know, we don't disagree with, but it really didn't move the needle. And I think in that instance, it was about... Um, women's incarceration rate, uh, the fact that they are increasing. Um, this person wanted to come and give me some more other information to show that, oh, in fact, they're de decreasing, which I didn't agree with that premise. But at the end of the day, the issue is there's still an issue, right? And so I think uh, being clear at the outset of what is this work supposed to be, what are you trying to yield is very critical. Um, in contrary, we see a stark difference when we work with community researchers. So with the um, what was in Detroit, green lights, green futures, that kind of um, fizzled, but they still put out their report. And in putting out their report, you know, they came back to us and I was part of those focus groups to have those conversations. And the outcome was a very handy green booklet that says surveillance ain't safety. And that's that's what you want. You want community partners to be in this work together, that whether you're in Detroit or the metro area, you have a stake in this too. So it's not just my clients and the folks that work in my office, but you as a resident, as a commuter, as someone who traverses the city of Detroit, you should also want these things. And we see just a world of difference uh, when we're working with folks who are community oriented. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. Um, Eric, how about you next? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Eric Wellsby, I'm the Advocacy Director at Detroit Disability Power. Um, we're a social justice organization um, focused primarily on organizing um, and building the political power of people with disabilities. Um, you know, with a focus particularly in Detroit, but um, honestly statewide and working with statewide partners um, to address, you know, the, the, the barriers that exist um, on everything from voting um, to, you know, any number of policy areas, housing, um, you know, and, and, and other things. Um, you know, we, we're very fortunate, I think, to have partners with organizations like STPP, um, you know, who, you know, we're a small organization. We have not, nine, nine people. Um, and, and a slew of interns um, from, from U of M and Wayne State um, to, to help us. But as a small group, you know, there's only so much we can do. And when people ask for our, our time, um, you know, we do have to be selective um, in, that, in that capacity. Um, but to have partners like STPP that really, you know, Ask, tr truly and deeply ask us, what, what do you need? What are, what are the questions you want answered but don't have the capacity to answer? Um, and we could use all the great minds we have access to um, and, and the tools and, and all of that to help us, um, which, you know, I think, you know, in finding, you know, way, a way to, for us both to get advantage, right, where students can learn and practice um, you know, for, for their future careers while um, also, you know, providing us with real tangible data. So when we go in and talk to city council or talk to state legislators, um, it's not just tell, us telling them what we see, but having that, you know, solid, solid background, um, you know, and finding, you know, and every research partnership is a little bit different um, with um, um, other places I've worked, we had partnerships um, uh, on research where, you know, our organization, um, representatives from our organizations have been um, co-principal investigators along university with re university researchers, right? So we have real stake in the game and, and, and have that position of power to, you know, voice and help guide that research in a way that's productive for the communities we serve. Um, you know, that we're not subjects of research, but we're part of it. Um, and, and, you know, that can benefit both, you know, the researchers, um, the, the universities and the community organizations and our neighborhoods um, and really making sure that everybody is getting some advantage and, and, and we can do our the best we can to avoid, you know, some of the exploitation um, that, you know, in the past has happened through research where, you know, researchers have come in. Um, you know, popped in, popped into a neighborhood, got their data, asked questions, took people's time and all that, and then left. And, and, and those communities never heard from them again, never found out what was the result of that research. Did it lead to anything? Um, you know, I'm really pushing back on that to say, you know, people need to be involved in the planning. They need to be involved in the execution of the research and they need to be involved in the, in, in the results. Um, and that's really a way to, you know, make communities feel that they're not being exploited, but also empowering communities to use that research to make real change, um, to, to, to make the improvements that, I mean, most research when they come in are trying to solve a problem. Um, let those communities be part of solve, of actually solving that problem because they're probably better equipped than, you know, people from outside of that those communities. Um, and so, you know, we really appreciate uh, uh, STVP putting energy into this and allowing us to be a part of it. Um, so hopefully we can make better relationships, um, you know, for, for everybody involved. Thanks, Eric. Uh, moving on to Yvonne. Hi everyone, my name is Yvonne Navarrete. I she and her pronouns. I'm the policy director with We The People Michigan. We The People Michigan is a statewide organizing grassroots nonprofit looking to build multiracial working class power across the state. What that looks like is we um, organize with folks in local to statewide policy campaigns. Um, those campaigns range from looking to repeal uh, the ban on local rent control, reinstating driver's licenses for undocumented folks, and holding util investor-owned utility companies accountable from among other um, campaigns. And it's been a really um, wonderful experience to have partners like STPP and the other folks on this call in um, partnership of, in our campaigns. And I'll pass it to Marita to talk a little bit more about the ways we've specifically been able to partner with STPP. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marita. Um, I use they, she pronoun. 
I am a policy analyst with We the People. Um, I've been able, like, been able to work with STPP over the last few years and develop like really good relationship with you all over um, a good length of time. We first started working with STPP um, when in 2022, um, our org along with community partner orgs like DJC, um, shout out to Nancy, mm -hmm. um, like began a fight against the expansion of ShotSpotter, a um, faulty surveillance systems um, in the city of Detroit um, that asked to use APA money um, meant to um, expand like services for like community uh, members and residents. Um, and we were able to use a report um, from STPP on um, the very like technical um, definitions of like what the um, technology does and because of the um, the research that they were able to provide it really uh, expanded our organizing efforts and like our partner organizing efforts in that one it elevated the credibility of like the organizers on the ground um, when we brought up the issues with ShotSpotter and surveillance technology to public officials and specifically to Detroit City Councils and being able to say, this is a finding from the University of Michigan. Um, and even though, um, which the panelists and myself will touch upon later, that like um, live experiences of community members are very, very like important and critical a lot of the time um, this credibility is overlooked just because it's not from historically um, important or like because it's not from like institutions like universities or think tanks and such. So being able to like cite those resources and making um, the research accessible to the community members and the public and in terms that they can convey and like integrate it into, hey, like this is what the um, technology actually does to a community. Um, being able to do that is very, very valuable to us. And because of that, um, along with like the organizing of people and like community members showing up to um, public comments of shot spotters, we were able to push back against the expansion of ShotSpotter, at least like freeing up seven millions of um, APA money from being used on this surveillance technology. Um, so just like very, very appreciative of, of STPP. And recently um, we partnered with STPP and Little Sis um, on a report to advance our um, campaigning goals on um, just on like centering on pe um, people own like um, energy. Thanks, uh, Yvonne and Marita. Um, and then next up, uh, Maddie Cutler. Hi, I'm a, one of the research assistants on the team for the project. I'm a senior undergraduate student at the Ford School of Public Policy, and I've been a research assistant since last May. Um, alongside Molly and Divya, I worked on um, all parts of the project of from the research to the interviewing of the partners who we just heard from and the actual writing of the project. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thanks, Maddie and Divya. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Divya. I'm one of the other research assistants that are student research assistants on this project. I'm also a graduate student in computer science, and I work on kind of the uh, go governance and responsible AI questions. Um, and that's really, yeah. Great. Thank you. So um, you all just covered so much about, um, so I had all these great warm up questions to sort of get us going, but I feel like you've already touched on that so much that I'm just going to take us right into the deep end. Um, so, you know, one thing that came up a lot in our conversations was the power dynamics between researchers that are associated with 
big universities or companies um, and staff in community organizations um, like yours and also community members themselves. Um, let's talk a little bit about how those power dynamics play out and what both sides can do to mitigate them. And feel free, I think people can just unmute and jump in and if it gets too unruly, I'll start to call on people. Sounds good. I'll jump in here, Molly. Um, I think in terms of mitigating the dynamics, um, how, what, what I touched on earlier about like making sure like we're equal, equal partners, like that is literally felt and we can, we know at the outset whether this is going to be something that's going to feel not good to us. And again, that extractive exploitative, or if it's something that we actually want to be a part of. So um, what is it, like, what is the end goal, right? You're going to, you're going to get a research paper, a white paper. Um, what is your intention? What do you want to do with that? Is that something that is supposed to serve the community to inform uh, stakeholders to make a change? And so we need to know um, very clearly what is the goal of this, like very early, because that will show us whether this is something that um, you know, we want to participate in. Um, and also very concretely, and, and this has happened before, and I just have to like pawn people off. If there is no exchange of compensation for my labor, that is a clear indicator that you are not valuing me, you know, value my expertise and what I'm bringing to this conversation. So if you feel like this is one of those things where like, hey, let me get an hour of your time. Let me sit down for this. And you have raised nothing about how much you are going to compensate me for this. I'm already not doing this. Right. We can we can talk about how much funding you have. Right. What has been approved? What are your limitations? I get that. But as Eric stated, like we're all just young nonprofits that are trying to pay our staff and change the world, right? And these researchers, these institutions, these universities, you have a wealth of resources at your disposal. So to come to us without that offering of what a compensation package looks like is a non-starter for me. And so I just want to put that out at the outset instead of burying it. That is the lead. Are you coming to these people and saying, we value you, we respect you, we want your input, your, your expertise, your knowledge, and this is how much we have for this project, period. And, and if I can add, add on to Nancy, um, even beyond taking care of, you know, making sure that there's compensation for the nonprofit is, you know, so much of this research, you know, isn't even about our nonprofits, it's about the communities we serve, um, and, and really making, you know, making it a point of how are we taking care of this community? Um, you know, a lot of times we're, you know, we want to, you know, we want to do interviews or panels or, or focus groups with members of the community. Um, you know, people who aren't researchers and also aren't working for our nonprofit, people who have jobs and families and busy lives, um, and their time isn't free either. Um, you know, and it doesn't mean paying them hundreds or thousands of dollars. Sometimes it's, 25 or 50 dollars you know for an out but it's still it's saying there's value in that and that I'm, I'm i'm asking you to give up what you normally do to do this right um to to just make sure that again we're not we we don't look at at you know members of a community and their time as something that's just mine to use um it is something that 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 they are are choosing to share with with, with me and with the researcher um and and they should be you know their expertise is clearly the thing we need. Their lived experience is what we need. And we should be willing to, to compensate them for that. Um, you know, and so making sure that that's part of the discussion, um, you know, and really, you know, you know, using that um, as, you know, getting back to Molly's original question about that power dynamic, right? Um, some of our power comes from the fact that we have access to the people that researchers need, right? Um, universities, um, particularly, you know, sometimes, are, are, right, and other researchers um, are isolated sometimes from the communities they want to study. And that's where these com community organizations like ours come in. We know who the people are. We're a trusted messenger. And if we're going to put that trusted, you know, messenger power to work, like, you got to prove to me that it's worth putting it out there. Because if that gets burned for us with our members and the communities we serve, 
Like that's a long-term issue for us. We don't put that at risk or we don't put that out there. We think someone's going to exploit it. Um, we can't because if we lose that, we're way behind in the work we need to do. Um, you know, and so that's really a big part of where our power comes from is protecting our community, protecting the people we serve um, and serving as that gatekeeper. And if you want access to our community um, and want access to the people we serve, you got you to prove that you're you're in this. You're in this, um, you know, we're in this as a partner and you're in this um, in a way that is going to make sure this community knows um, that you're not here just to exploit them. Yeah, and another way that um, challenging the power dynamic between researchers and community partners is critical is putting the power of deciding and commissioning, in a sense, the research into the partner's hands, instead of as the researcher already coming with a designed or proposed or requesting like support in a, their own research project. Um, something that I've appreciated about the way that we engage with STDP is that they say, these are the resources we have and the type of support we can offer. How can we use that to support your ongoing work? And that's exactly how we came to um, design and create uh, the consumer's energy report because we had been doing long-term organizing around holding investor-owned utilities accountable, but largely based out of Southeast Michigan, where our energy provider is DTE. And so we had done a DTE report and had plenty of data around um, how much um, DTE is exploiting, extorting from communities and uh, working class people of color, specifically around Detroit, and how much they're using that to line their investors' profits. But we didn't have that data and analysis for Consumers Energy, which is the energy company out in West Michigan. And as a statewide organization, our organizing reaches the entire state. And so being able to create that resource, not just for our organizers, but to then utilize it to inform legislators and decision makers um, who are in the past may have turned their nose up and said, well, I'm only seeing DTE data and I'm a legislator in Grand Rapids, that doesn't affect me. Now we have data to back up the claims that this is a statewide issue um, and we need to hold all investor owned utilities accountable. I think related to this, this question of power, I wanted to talk about pace for a minute. So. Uh, at different times, I've heard a few of you use the expression, move at the speed of trust. Um, what does the speed of trust look like to you and how does that play out in partnerships? I'll jump in here, Molly, because that is one of those sacred um, uh, texts or affirmations that we say is that we move at the speed of trust and we really do mean that. And so as a... A legal arm, we feel that we have to hold that dear because we have to move at the speed that we, the people of Michigan, DDP, Detroit Action, what feels good to them. Um, it, it serves no purpose as we as lawyers are like, okay, now we got to file the lawsuit. We got to do this. And they're like, no, that, that's not right. We need to talk to the people. We need to organize. We, you know what I mean? So we do that ourselves. And so when we're working in partnerships with um, researchers and, and outside folks, deadlines are artificially created, right? Some human has said, we want to pump this out by X amount of date. Do timelines reflect the actual time that's needed to build trust with the community to talk about said issue or to uh, produce um, you know, the information that's necessary? And so it shows up in what is the speed that you're trying to move, does that actually align with the project and what it will take? Um, can we get to know you first? You can't just have one intro Zoom and then like, all right, give me all this information. We need to know who we are working with. And while we have found uh, post 2020, uh, quite honestly, being in the racial justice space, post the lynching of George Floyd and the murder of Breonna Taylor, people started co-opting our language. So you hear people talking about this racial reckoning and restorative justice and accountability, but are you just spouting these words or do they actually hold true to you? Um, Yodit dropped a question in the chat that's apropos of this because this is part of our values. 
And so we have to work with folks that our values align. And now at DJC, we have a, a, a list of very specific, very uh, personal values that we hold. We don't expect everyone that we work with to check all of those boxes, but there has to be synergy within there. And so going back to what I said at the top in terms of paying people, that's a value that we hold within the or. So any intern that comes to us, we believe in paying people for their labor. So we're not asking an outside partner something that we don't follow through on. That is just an ethos of how we move. You must pay people for their labor in this country too much. We just extract labor and, and, and resources from people without actually compensating them, right? So that's one of the things. Um, and moving with a sense of responsibility and a desire to use that to serve the community. These are our values. And when we work in partnership, we can tell very early, is this a project that is going to be in alignment with our values? Do you believe in the liberation of all people? Do you believe in disability justice and access for all? Do you believe in LGBTQIA plus people having autonomy and rights like everyone else? We don't work with people who are transphobic, you know, who are ableist, right? We, we try to vet them because if we are at a disconnect, it will bear in the work. It will show up very easily because the, the two just can't coincide. Um, and so we try to bake our values into when we are presented. Is this a intergenerational work? You know, again, who will benefit? Uh, do you believe it, as lawyers and also just the, the org in large, we believe in democratizing access to the law, which means that we are not trying to be gatekeepers of anything that we have mastered. Quite to the contrary, we want to disseminate that information and teach the man to fish, right? So that whatever information we gain, we're trying to synthesize it and disseminate it in a way that people can use it, they understand it, and they no longer need me. That's what I wanna see from your research. And so I'll stop there and let others jump in. <clears throat> Um, I think like this touch on this question and also the previous question, but um, what Nancy and Eric share on like really showing up um, for the org that you're working with, value alignment, that means that showing like your partner that your collaboration is genuine, not just like, oh, here is a deliverable that um, we work on and then we never like hear from you again type of thing. But like what um, we really appreciated from like STPP um, during our fight, um, again, Shot Spotter, I remember um, Molly like coming to our press event and being um, a speaker um, at the press events right before the public comments. Um, so being able to show up for us um, with a notice and just like elevating, continue to like advocate for us, not just like in this like short time frame, and continue to doing that. And like a year later, Kristen like coming to one of our open meetings uh, with the STPP coalitions and community members, um, and getting to know um, more about the issues like with the residents here. So really, really appreciate that. And it's about like expanding our capacity, not like, oh, we want to do research on you, um, but like, yeah, just being genuine in your collaboration. Um, awesome. All right. So this is, I'm realizing that we're, um, we're coming up on time to, um, to take audience questions. So I'm gonna do a quick question specifically for Maddie and Divya, the students who worked on this project, because I do think for us in STPP, one of the um, one of the important things for us in these partnerships is that we are training students and training, especially um, in the case of Divya, technologists and future technologists who are going to go off and know how to do these kinds of uh, partnerships and do this work in a way um, that that serves communities. And so um, I wanted to ask both of you um, 
if there's anything that surprised you in the in the process of of having these conversations and doing this work, something anything that came out that really stood out to you about this process? I guess I can go first. Um, I guess the main thing that I noticed that was a little bit surprising, but in retrospect, perhaps not so surprising, is that people who do this kind of work, like the three organizations that are here and other organizations that do similar work, are already thinking about all of these topics that we've been discussing on their own. It's part of what they do. So when we ask them questions like, what do you look for in a partner or what hasn't worked for you in the past? It became really clear that these questions are actually like really close to how they do their work on an everyday basis. And community organizations are easily able to share with you how their core values and missions guide whether a certain project is a certain or whether a certain project is a good idea. And they have actual benchmarks and procedures to go through this process. And I think for us to learn about those benchmarks and those processes was really, really illuminating and gave us a lot of really great information. And it was kind of then when I realized that the real value of what we're doing is bridging the gap between those organizations and getting that information out to others, like whether it's an academic institution like us, who we learned how to be better from this project, even though we've been working with orgs in the past, we've learned this helped us learn how to be better, or even outside technologists that organizations often work with. It was kind of obvious to us that we didn't, they didn't, they weren't waiting around for someone to ask us these questions or ask them these questions. These questions were already very important to how they do their work. And I think that that should be shared with as many people as possible because that's really important. Yeah, uh, so for me, I think that I echo uh, Maddie's uh, sentiments and also one of the things that really stood out for me was Nancy's, um, you know, comment about like importance of value alignment. It, it's it's so crucial to having uh, partners and technologists work together. And I think as somebody who comes from an engineering background, it's so uh, common to kind of like not talk about values, not talk about talk about subjectivities because you know you want to be objective you want to be talking about how you're doing this from a neutral standpoint but I think for a fruitful partnership um, it's very important to acknowledge acknowledge this politics those values and kind of come to a shared understanding and this takes a lot of time and I think this was uh, I think the, the, uh, just putting it out there is so important and I think this is a message that we should carry back to our spaces and so it's yeah Awesome. Thank you both. So then before I open it up to questions to, from the audience, um, it is, um, I think, really uh, a treat to have this much advocacy, knowledge and power in one virtual place, all of you together. Um, and so I wanted to give us a chance to ask you, give you a chance to ask each other questions. I know some of you work together, like, you know, completely independently of anything STPP is involved in. Um, but I just figured while we're all in one place, that might be a chance to sort of continue some of those conversations or bring out, bring out things that you say to each other that researchers need to hear, but maybe haven't. Um, this is Eric, not, not necessarily a question, but just kind of a, a thing. Um, you know, we, we recently moved into um, a brand new building with other social justice organizations, including the Detroit uh, Justice Center as well as our upstairs no downstairs neighbor um who's on what floor um but you know the the opportunity this gives us to be in a space with you know four or five organizations that are all social justice but we're all doing very different things um but the ability like these spaces create for us to work together um and you know through some of the other coalitional partnership work we're doing um both in detroit and across the state right um Help allows us to identify where our strengths and weaknesses are and how that can then we can we can cooperate work together. Um, and, you know, one of the things I, I love is, is the relationships we have with any number of organizations that when someone comes to us, um, like STPP or, or others come to us and ask us, hey, can you do this? Can you not? When we can't, I we probably have someplace else we can connect you with who can um, who has the capacity or has better background knowledge in it. And so, you know, recognizing how the relationship we have, if if we can't do it, we probably can connect you it does because um, social justice organizations in particular, I think in this 
area of the state um, are really doing um, um, very intentional work around building connections with each other so that we can all take our limited capacity, but collectively really do exponentially larger work. Um, and, you know, th I think that's huge for us, but I think it's also huge for, you know, researchers that um, getting a good relationship with one of us opens up the possibility to having good relationships with a lot of others, which is good for individual researchers, but also entire departments and institutions um, who have all kinds of varied research expertise. Um, and not everything is a DDP thing. Some things, uh, you know, DJC is much better equipped to talk about and help with than we are. And, and we love, we, we love connecting them, you know, and so, um, you know, always be aware of, of how our networks work and how, um, you know, how much that can, that can help lift all boats. Yes. Thank you very much, Eric. To that, I would like to uh, posit the contrary um, to my panelists and then also folks who are listening you are privy to this as well. As much as we talk to each other about the good research projects and the good ones, y'all, we have to start letting each other know the researchers and universities and folks who are hitting us up that are coming to us completely sideways and we're like never again. And we internally know who they are, right? But I think it's time we start, you know, talking that dirt as well for that, uh, yeah, that internal Yelp review of beware of this researcher because you know they didn't handle with care and consideration and hold those values sacred. So y'all who are listening in, just know that um, similarly to how things go well, we will share that knowledge and pass you off to our friends and colleagues in the space. If it doesn't go well, you're also shooting yourself in the foot because we have that power to you know talk to each other and say, hey, don't work with these folks ever. So just want to pose that out there that we we get our Yelp page going. Thanks, Yvonne. I had a quick question for the panelists, um, kind of based on what Nancy was talking about in her introduction, but for anyone, um, when it comes to really trying to figure out the values-based match, when whether it's um, about disability specifically or larger ideas like abolitionism and supporting trans rights and other ideas that your organization is firmly in support of, how much of a toll does it take, how much work does it take on your organization to go through that process intensively and how? what are the, some of the struggles or like the um, kind of stopping points that you come to when you're trying to address those deeper values? Because I know that sometimes it can be hard when you're working at a partner, whether it's more surface level, like um, indicator signals that you're getting that are supposed to sound a certain way versus actual genuine values grounded in the actual work. So I was just kind of curious, like how it, is it, how hard is it to kind of differentiate between those two? Um, this is Eric, um, just real quick. I, one of our mottos um, is the way we do the work is the work. And um, one of the things I, I've, I've learned about that is a lot of times when you're talking to new organizations, you can very quickly figure out how they do the work, um, you know, based on how they approach, you know, setting up even that first meeting, um, you know, and how, you know, open they are to, to changes and adjustments. You become very clear how they do the work. And as a, as a disability focused organization, right, there's a lot of things that we do different than other organizations, right, to make sure that all of our members, um, um, you know, regardless of their their disability, um, you know, and and you know how that might impact their way to engage, right? We want to make sure that every single one of our members, every single member of our community, can be involved in everything we do. Um, and so, you know, we can quickly kind of evaluate, like, are you actually open to like, the flexibility necessary for everyone to be engaged? Um, and, and when we don't see that, um, you know, that 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 very quickly shuts it down. If you're going to exclude part of our membership, then then we probably don't have time because um, we, we can't teach you. Um, we got we had other work we got to do. So, um, you know, that that's for us. Yvonne, did you also have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I can quickly add something. I think that um, if research partners don't like meet us where we are, typically we don't have the capacity to engage. Like if 
participating or accessing resources um, to do research through your organization or funder, et cetera, requires like a lengthy application, interviews, um, et cetera, like this lengthy process beyond like also us assessing right values alignment and getting to know if like this makes sense for us. Um, typically we pass on it. And so being able to like, I guess um, research partners self vet themselves. If they come to us, they've already made done a couple of steps to be able to find us and offer their resources in the way that makes sense for us. Um, and typically when we've had to like uh, look for specific um, technologists or posters or things like that, where we do need specific kind of support. Um, it is quite a lengthy process. It takes some time and relationships, like asking each um, partners who they've worked with before um, and their experiences. Otherwise, yeah, it's um, you have to go through hard learned experience to be able to figure out who is worth working with or not. Great, and so I think we have time for a couple of uh, audience questions. If you haven't put any questions in the chat yet, now is your moment to put them in the Q&A box. Um, Nancy already started to address this question, but I wanna sort of bring it back to the whole group and it's also connected to what Maddie asked. Uh, but Yudit asks, says, uh, Nancy, you mentioned the importance of values alignment. Can you say a bit more about how you use your values when vetting a partner? Um, so we sort of started hearing about this, but if there are other, other things to say about that piece. Yeah, kind of like I mentioned before, I mean, it's, um, and it's with everything that we do, right? It's not just with our research partners, it's with facilitators that we bring in, it's with vendors that we use, um, it's with the money that we accept. There has to be a level of accountability as to who we're working with. And if anyone is causing harm in our communities, those aren't people that we wanna be in partnership with in any way, shape or form. So there is a level of like, who are you? Do we already know your name kind of like in the streets? What have you done? Your work precedes you. Like we're gonna know who you are. And as Yvonne alluded to or, or stated outright, if you're coming to us, you know who we are. So don't come to me and think that at DJC, you're gonna get a reformist position on anything. We are abolitionists. And so if, if that right there, you're you know, not open to um, acknowledging and accepting that as a true concrete um, you know, praxis, then we don't need to be in partnership with one another. Um, when you work with nonprofits that are mission focused, mission driven, the values bear out with everything. So if we're, if we're, and we're still learning all the things, right? Which is why we love uh, DDP as a partner. They provide us with trainings where we learn like, oh, wow, okay. We thought we were doing this right, but we actually, every event we have, we need to make sure there's ASL or at least ask people, what are your accessibility needs, right? So we, we're not perfect. We learn as we go. And that's what we expect of those that we work with. If someone is misgendering our folks, we should correct you. You should accept that correction and change and do better. But if you're like, no, nah, I don't, I don't care. That's what, well, now we're not going to mess with you. You know what I mean? So it's, it's not that people have to be perfect. But is that, our, do you recognize who we are? Do you see us? Do you acknowledge us? And then in working together, are you open um, to change? And so it's it's very critical. It's part and parcel of just how we move. Um, like Eric said, like how we work is also who we are. It is the work. And so, um, yeah, vetting folks, if, if I can't find any information on you or if it looks like, and this person is very centric and, and right-leaning, well, we're diametrically opposed. And why even get in this relationship, right? So, and even if they're like, oh, we're going to uh, offer you X amount of money, then that's where you, it's a whole calculus that you're taking into consideration because not all money is good money and we cannot be bought. So are you here for the substance of the work and to move each mission forward? Are you here so that, everyone in the state of Michigan 
has electoral power and their voice is being heard and they're getting their utilities and everything, they can actually thrive. Are you moving towards a society that is accessible for everyone where you're honoring um, different access needs? Do you have closed caption on the Zoom? You know what I mean? Just do you, do, are you trying to tear down mass incarceration? Cause you've seen what is done to devastate the black community. And if you're not in line with these basic principles, then there's nothing that we can do together. Awesome. Uh, so I think we've got, I've got one last question here that's sort of an uh, uh, adapting a question that came in through the chat, which is, um, so when you're engaged in community partnerships, um, is it harder or easier when it comes to issues specifically of science and technology? So we're the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Center, like our program. When we come to you all, we sort of say we can do all these different things. Science and technology is a big umbrella, but we, you know, there's still a portion of it. So I'd love to hear um, if there's anything particular that you all have noticed about those kinds of science and tech questions and issues that we deal with and what that means in terms of um, working with partners. I mean, I, I can say, I, I, I think science technology is super interesting. I don't know anything about that, um, right? Um, and so, you know, we come at it from a very, you know, we're looking at how things are impacting um, people with disabilities. And I know there was a, a question um, in the chat related to, um, you know, AI technology um, and things like that, which, you know, I, I, have, I have enough understanding um, of it to know what it is, and that's about it. Um, but to be able to, you know, talk with with people and, um, you know, one of the things I, I love about working with STPP is I don't always know the question, but I can talk with them and they can they, they, they work cooperatively to help us find the right question we need to be answering, um, you know, to to answer the questions of our community, but also to answer the questions of, you know, particularly in my case, like talking to policymakers um, who often don't understand technology. Um, either. So, um, and so, you know, that, that type of partnership and that ability for me to have a very poorly formed concept in question and bring it to people that understand this and, and can help, you know, help us find that middle road of their understanding of technology and my understanding of policy and the impacts on people with disabilities to find that real question where we can get the data and the research we need so that I sound much smarter than I am about these things. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's walking that really careful line because I can't be an expert in everything. Um, I, if, I, if I'm an expert on anything, um, but you know, the, this partnership really does allow us um, to, to be impactful on things that um, I think we'd struggle. We just don't have the capacity to, to dig as deep as they can. And, and so, you know, I'm very, again, you know, grateful for the opportunity to, um, you know, use all of their experience and knowledge um, to help make our, our work stronger. And I'll add that when it comes to science and tech, maybe it's harder to find partners that you are values aligned with. And so uh, in that sense, it's harder. But when you do find partners that are willing to like use their research and resources to support and align with your campaigns related to surveillance technology, um, utility companies, et cetera, it's really worth it. And it makes our work much easier in the long run. It makes our ability to understand the technology and data around it easier, our ability to synthesize it and share it with the public and our base and the people we need to mobilize and um, our ability to hold electeds accountable and showing facts in their face um, and applying pressure to them makes it much easier for sure. Thanks so much. So we are at time. So I just want to um, again, thank all of our panelists and co-authors, uh, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, if you are interested in finding the playbook or um, other reports that we've done, including for all of the partners that you um, heard from here today, you can find all of that on STPP's website at stpp.portschool.umich.edu. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>